Welcome to Sound and Vision, conversations with contemporary artists and musicians about the creative process. Here's the host of Sound and Vision, Brian Alfred. Sound and Vision is sponsored by Golden Artist Colors. Golden Artist Colors makes the best paint you can buy. You can find their products at any art store or online at goldenpaints.com. Sound and Vision is also sponsored by Fulcrum Coffee Roasters. Head over to fulcrumcoffee.com and check out all the different coffee varieties they have to order. And you can also check out their subscriptions. From $15 a month, you can order different coffees to be delivered to your door. Check out Fulcrum Coffee Roasters at fulcrumcoffee.com. Kurt Cowper was born in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1966 and raised in a suburb of Boston, Massachusetts. He received his BFA from Boston University in 1988 and his MFA from UCLA in 1995. He's lived in New York City for the past 20 years. His figure paintings of historical and imagined people tend to leave expectations unfulfilled and elude simple categorization. In contradistinction to his clear and precise articulations of form, Kurt's content is characterized by intermediacy, unintentionality, ambiguity, fluidity, destabilization, strangeness, immorality, uselessness, and neutrality. Kurt has had solo shows at Acme Gallery in Los Angeles, Deitch Projects in New York City, and Almin Reich Gallery in New York. He's been included in numerous group exhibitions both in the United States and Europe, including venues such as the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Pompidou Center in Paris, the Kunsthal Vienna, and the Stedelijk Museum in Ghent. He's received numerous awards, including grants from the Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation, the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation, and the Paula Krasner Foundation. His work is included in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Hammer Museum, the Oakland Museum of Art, the Weatherspoon Museum, and the Yale University Art Gallery. He's taught at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Yale University, Princeton University, and the New York Academy of Art. And he's currently a professor of art at Queens College in New York City. I spoke with Kurt about Ong and Manet, having a rare name, eco-friendly materials, strangeness in painting, and much more. Here's our conversation. Perfect. All right, we're in business. So here's my here's my guess. I'm pretty sure this is right. You were born in Indianapolis because your father was a NASCAR racer, and then he moved off the circuit after two years, and that's why you went to Boston. Exactly. How'd you know? See? I mean, it's, I'm good at this. Yeah. <laughs> no, I guess we did live near the Speedway, but I, I have no memory of any of that. Well, at two years I old, I wish yeah. that was my story. Yeah. You'd probably only have a hearing loss trauma left over from that that's if you right. went to any yeah. of those. Have you ever been yeah. to a race? Um, no, I've been to a demolition derby. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that kind of goes against the long hair theory that we had before. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's not true. I guess there's some buzz cuts at a demo derby. Yeah. And I was like 10. A perfect age. So no, but those, yeah, I, those raceways are so loud. I bet. Yeah. Like I've been to NASCAR races and that was the thing that shocked me. I always thought it was going to be like a bunch of like people yelling and screaming and rowdy fans. Everyone sits there in silence because with these headphone blockers, because it's so loud when so you go loud. around the track. Oh, yeah. it's, it's visceral. You know, I mean, NASCAR is a curious thing, right? Because um, in you know, I grew up outside of Boston, and I lived in New York now for over twenty years. And we have no consciousness of NASCAR. No. Like it doesn't touch our culture at all. It but it's huge in parts of this country. It's very yeah. strange. It is weird. It's it's when you get out of the city, it's I mean, I'm sure you're we all are conscious of that more so than ever of the the difference between the divide, city yeah. urban yeah. things right now, the the, the people, Definitely. the ideologies. And then when you get out like, you know, I'm in Pennsylvania a lot. I'm from Pittsburgh and I teach at Penn State. We call it Pencil Tucky. Like when you're in the middle of Pennsylvania, it is rustic. You know what yeah. I mean? There's a different yeah. sensibility out there. 
Right. Is it Pennsylvania. huge in Pennsylvania? Yeah, there's the Poconos. Oh, yeah? Uh, that's where I went to see it, in the Poconos. And oh, yeah. I mean, it is, NASCAR is, I feel like anywhere when you get outside the city, there's people are into it. I don't think um, in I don't think in Massachusetts that's true. I, I, I'm in Massachusetts right now visiting uh, my family, and I don't think that's true here. Yeah, although it could be. So you grew, but you grew up in the city or near the city or suburbs. I grew up in the suburbs of Boston, a, a town called Situate. How far were you from? downtown 25 miles i'm really bad at boston like i don't know anything about i mean i've been there a bunch but i don't know much about the outlining areas i feel like i just i missed the boston thing you know uh you didn't miss much (laughs) (laughs) um the town i grew up in was 25 miles south of boston on the coast oh nice i love the coastline i just went up to connecticut just to go look at the water (laughs) yeah i mean i didn't you know, I, maybe I took it for granted. I didn't really go to the beach I, to this day. I don't like the beach. Um, but I do, you know, I like going up to Maine, but, um, that wasn't like being close to the water, even though literally I was close to the water, but being close to the water wasn't a big part of my, um, experience. Yeah, it's a different. Well, that's why Maine is good, is because you can be quote unquote at the water, but it's not beach like a lot of it. It's just yeah. kind of scenic and there's a nice feel to it, you know? Yeah, that's true. But you grew up near the water. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, assuming your dad wasn't a NASCAR driver, were your parents, what was their line of work? What did he do? So my father was a very old, my father was very old. He was born in 1911 in Germany. And um, he, you know, obviously was an immigrant. He came to the U.S. in the 50s. And he was trained in Germany as a printer. Although his, um, his life in Germany is a little bit obscure to us still, although we, we get more and more information all the time. But he, I know he, he took his printing skills, a kind of old fashioned printing. Um, and he worked in, he worked in print shops. Um, and eventually he was the manager of print shops, um, in different places in and around Boston. And, um, my mother was an artist in the sixties. She had an advertising art studio in, in Indianapolis. And then that failed because my father, who was actually running the business end of it, was withholding federal taxes from the employees, but not sending them to the government. And eventually Uh the IRS came in and shut them down. And that's when they moved back to Boston. And my mother started teaching um, in junior high and then high school. So she was an art teacher, high school art teacher. So they got their feet under them again in a new place. Yeah. My father left when we were 12, but more or less they did. <laughs> yeah. Well, he got his feet under him in a different way. Yeah. And, and departed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, it sounds like that said, creativity and making things was around yeah, definitely. as you were growing up. So I'm sure you were yeah. drawing. And I mean, I would, it would be a great story if you said to me, yeah, I didn't really draw much as a kid. This is like I was sketching when I was like 23 in college and I figured I'm pretty good at this. No, I wasn't. <laughs> but you seem like you were always probably good yeah. at it and doing I it. I mean, I, I've listened to several of your podcasts and I know sometimes you talk about that with people, but no, I was not that person. I mean, you know, the, I know a lot of artists like that and a lot of those, a lot of people who started later, you know, can sometimes be the most interesting artists, but no, I was one of those people who was always drawing. And, you know, I was always, you know, one of those kids who was thought of as the best artist in the class. So that, you know, again, that doesn't mean much um, in the long run, but I was that kid. Yeah. I think it probably means more to your, like the way you think about being perceived as an artist more so than making stuff. I think that's right. You know what I mean? And, And it, it also, since, ki- since if you're a kid and you're thought of as the best artist in the class, 
that virtually always means that you're the best at representational image making. Of right? course. Yeah. And so that's definitely um, influenced me just in that I always have an insecurity in the back of my mind that I'm not pursuing that um, objective completely enough. If that makes what, any of, sense. Of, of making things look like other things? Uh, of, like I always, yes. You know, there's part of me that wants to always just pursue extremely traditional. Right, right. Um, you know, like developing that skill as fully as possible. I've, but I, I've had to very consciously convince myself that other things are important too. And so it's in a way, a kind, I think I've thought of it as a kind of impediment to my development. You know, it just goes to show you're damned if you do and you're damned if you yeah, don't. Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, there's so many artists that I, even students that I teach in school who are really gifted at representation. Like they know how to make things look like yeah. things, just they're really good at it. And they're, they're always torn between, well, I've got the skill, like, and, and you get something from that. Like people are like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and then they're sure. always torn because they, they want that and they want to be good. But at the same time, they're like, well, maybe I should be tweaking things or getting loose with it. Or they just want to see what the dark side's like, you know, like, right. you know, they see a Kandinsky and they're like, oh boy, like maybe I could dip my toes in there, but no, I can't because I can make things look really. And then the people who are unencumbered with skill like myself who could never make something look exactly like something else we're just like it's house money we're like whatever let's just do what we want to do you know yeah it's like when i play guitar i'm not that good so i could always just write songs that i want to write because you know it's it's not like i have the chops to play like bach on that thing and and you know it's mm -hmm. weird for me to just play a pop song or something so it I feel like any side of the fence you're on, you're always like, ah, should I be doing a little more the other thing or, you know, or. It well, well the, it's all, the fact is it's usually people who are, it's rarely the most skilled artists, I think in any discipline who are in the end, the most interesting. I there are probably some, ex agree. some exceptions, but rarely. It's, and, it's you know, rare. I, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I, I think it's tough. It's, it's, it's almost like you could make an analogy of you have two kids in a beginning drawing class. You have one kid who has a couple pieces of charcoal and a giant piece of paper. You have another kid who comes in and he's got this gigantic art supply box filled with every supply known to man. Some you you feel like maybe the person with the charcoal just might make a better drawing because they just they're like well i'm gonna have at it i'm gonna keep it simple and just gonna go for it and the other person's got so much going on that you know it, it they're not building from the ground up it's just like what you almost like paralysis with all these options <laughs> yeah for sure you know the more you have in a way sometimes that can make things more difficult but i know that's not for everyone but generally speaking i think that can. Yeah, it can. And, and there's also no guarantee that someone who has that facility has everything else that it takes to make an interesting artist. Yeah, that's so, true. I mean, like the experience, like life experience or yeah. uh, what else? All Whatever the else it is. Yeah. 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 I, I remember, I think it was, I was listening to an interview with the guy from Vampire Weekend and he was saying that he feels like he writes better songs because he's not of, of some of the things he doesn't know how to do on a guitar. And, you know, sometimes not knowing all the ways can be liberating in a sense. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Even, you know, I, I, I love Van Gogh. I especially love his drawings. And it's really fascinating to look at his early work when he was really trying hard to be a successful artist in the 19th century mode. You know, he was doing those... I don't know if you've seen those drawings he did of casts and of ancient sculpture. Yep. And he was really trying to figure out how to make academic drawing, and he could never do it. Right. Um, but he, but all of that filtered into his work um, in you know in, in an idiosyncratic way, and you know in many ways I think he's the he's certainly one of the best drawers of that century. Yeah. No, so, I agree. And I, I think there's something to be said for failure 
You know how yeah, sure. like now we kind of champion failure. We say like, listen, that's the way you learn. That's the way you get better. You got to try things and fail. I mean, in a way, when you're first starting out like that, you try to go maybe to the limit of your technical abilities and you say, okay, this is just something I'm not equipped to do. Right. So I'm going to sit in this area and try to make that as best I can. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Yeah, for sure. You know, my favorite artist of all time, if I had to choose one, is Ang. And in a way, he, he constantly failed. You know, he, he was this bizarre example of someone who thought he was producing art in the you know, absolutely noble classical tradition, but he was producing the most bizarre, perverse reimaginings of the figure, right. you know, that I can think of. And so in a, in a way, he's a, he's a, a, a great historical failure. Yeah, it's like the, it's funny, it's sometimes the intention is such, but the the way they miss it is yeah. what makes them so great, you Maybe, know what I mean, yeah. or so interesting. You know, sometimes I think that's always the case, or at least in the artists that I really love. Yeah, it's like that, that blurry area around it where things get really interesting. I mean, I've, I grew up around a lot of Warhol, being from Pittsburgh, and uh-huh. I've, I've always been interested in Warhol as a... Uh, you know the whole bit you know yeah. and some of like when i go to the museum or when i look at his work it's often the fringy stuff that people don't really know that well that are the things that i i really love and i'm like oh yeah that gets to the core of like him you uh-huh. know what i mean or there's that's where he's weird or you know like you can get hints about the other work in in some of the things that he failed at which become really you know like uh, van gogh you know those paintings that he did after ukiyo-e prints, which tell you a lot about what he was looking at and what his inspiration was, I don't think those are his best paintings by any stretch, but they're really interesting because they lead you into, you know, what he's looking at, what he's trying to accomplish, you know what I mean? And yeah, no, you definitely. you see the other work differently when you see that. I think Manet, who's one of my all-time favorite painters, I think his quirkiness and what in a way he kind of like fails at in a sense is really what makes him super interesting. You know yeah, I mean? definitely. I mean, with man, with man, it, it's really interesting because I don't even, I can never quite pinpoint what he actually did fail at. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not, right. it's not like he was, it, it doesn't seem to me that he was clearly trying to deviate from the academic norm. You know, like, with Picasso, it's clear. Like, at a certain point, he just gave up what he was able to do and was looking for other things. With Manet, I can never quite pinpoint that. Maybe it's in part because of how um, sort of inconsistent his paintings are, you know, for me, in a thrilling way. Um, But, yeah, he's a really fascinating artist in that sense. Yeah, he... Some of his most revolutionary accomplishments in his paintings uh, i mean i'm not a scholar on him but i i never quite know if he was fully intending that yeah or, no that's you true know what i mean For or sure. was he just getting the the you know the relationships wrong of the size or the angles and you know was he an accidental cubist yeah I mean, he's be- not because the barmaid is seen from a different angle that's like a very different angle in the reflection so that's cubism you know what i mean that's like two different perspectives at the same time that's a right. big move but you were like, was he thinking that? Like, was he, was he like pushing the envelope? And he, but the thing is, is conceptually he pushed the envelope all the time with Olympia. That's like a, that's a pretty bold painting as far as the subject matter, you know? So right. I, I think he was on to it. And, it. and that gray area is what, for me, makes it really interesting because you can't really figure it out. I mean, I guess I could devote my life to scholarship on him and figure out, but you know, it's to me that's exciting, like those areas where people, you know, yeah, where you can't quite locate, um, you know, the the place where the decisions are made. That really interests me about his work. Well, in developing in school, like when you started making, like when did you start drawing past, you know, like in high school, were you getting into art, or did it yeah, come more in college? It, it happened in high school that yeah. I that I became really invested in it. Yeah. So where were you pushing it? Like, what were you doing? How did you feel about your technique? And, 
you know, where is your sort of relationship to that idea of what you can accomplish, what you want to scale back on or tweak? Was that entering the equation at that point or were you just trying to make things look like other things? Well, first I was just trying to make things look like other things. I mean, so when I first started to really um, think seriously about making art, I guess it was the end of my sophomore year. And I remember the first drawing that I was really happy with was a drawing I did of the high school ceramic studio. And I, I mean, I, to this day, I remember setting up in front of, you know, in the studio and thinking I was just going to very carefully copy what I saw. And I remember starting from like the upper left and just copying, you know, in a very naive way. So every variation in value that I thought I was picking up, I would make note of, you know, without any, any kind of spatial thinking or any uh, thinking about the hierarchy of values or light. I had no idea what light was. You know, I was just this kind of naive copying. But it came out kind of good, or at least I thought it did. And, um, you know, so that, that was driving my, that's what motivated me for at least a while. But then, then I started taking classes outside of high school with this, with a portrait painter who had moved to, to a town near me from New York. He had been a fashion illustrator and portrait painter in New York. And um, I guess it was through him and through my mother that I was introduced to old masters. So I was looking at, um, you know, my mother gave me this art history book. It was Tansy's Art History. I still have it. And um, I remember looking through it, you know, and being blown away by Van Eyck, Rubens, Holbein, um, Raphael, um, who else did I love in that book? Um, you know, there were others. And I started to become really interested in the old masters and started looking at their drawings. And so that started to change the way I thought about drawing. And then I took high school classes at Boston University. And I had a good teacher there named Michael Monahan who um, showed me, you know, introduced me to, to ways of thinking about drawing. So that all happened, you know, from sophomore to junior year, or something like that in high school. Yeah. And I guess if you're going, you know, to those classes, are you, when, when are you first starting to go to museums and see some, because there's a big difference between seeing those works in reproduction and then when you actually see them in person, because in reproduction, it's like incomprehensible. You're like, wait, how are they doing this? You know? And then when you see it in person, there's the whole, it's also kind of incomprehensible in a way, but then you understand glazing or you learn about like how they're like building these layers and stuff. When did that first start happening when you're seeing that stuff in the flesh? Yeah, so I, I mean, my mother used to take me to, to museums when I was a kid, but I, I didn't really want to go back then, you know, when I was right. eight or 10. I wasn't one of those kids who, you know, like David Romanelli talks about that, going to the Met when he was like 10. That wasn't me. Um, but... By high school, I was going to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and um, and they have a great collection of Cop John Singleton Copley, who I think is a really interesting artist, actually, in his American period, and I, I loved him at that time. And then I went to um, when I was looking at art schools as a junior. I went to New York, and I stayed with two uncles of mine. I, I had uncles who lived on the Upper West Side. One was a stockbroker and the other was a fashion designer. And they started taking me to um, the Met and the Frick. So it was in my sophomore and junior year, I started to look seriously at art in museums. And when you saw it, were you, was there a a gap between the way you were making things and what you saw and you thought to yourself. Cause I remember when I was in an undergrad at Penn state, I would go to the Palmer and there were these still lives, these giant still lives with all this fruit that were like sweaty and there would be bugs on them and uh -huh. they were just, you could see the glaze in it. And at that point we were just starting to learn glazing, but it was like a, you know, kind of blew away my mind in the, in the sense of like, how do you make that surface? Like yeah. it was just, you know, it's almost like when you see glass blowing, it's just like such a specific, interesting process that, you know. 
And well, that's, it's different. You it know? made a huge difference. Like I remember realizing that painters at that time would build up the lights, you know, some, and sometimes, you know, you could literally, I didn't actually do it, but you could measure the height of the highlight as opposed to how thin the shadows were painted. So that type of thing I, I know, I know, and you don't see that in reproduction. Um, no, so it made a huge difference. Um, in the way I painted. And I also, I remember going to the Met for the first time and seeing an Ang painting for the first time. And there was something so strange about that painting. There was something about the way he interpreted and rendered form that was so clearly idiosyncratic that, um, that was incredibly meaningful for me. And I've always remembered that. Yeah. So what, were there, what, what happened when you saw like a Bosch painting? <laughs> it's pretty idiosyncratic. I, you know, that's, in, that's a really interesting question. So you're getting at a kind of like subject matter and content as opposed to form. You know, I, I lately I've come to realize that I'm really a formalist or at least that's how I think of myself. I didn't, I wouldn't have said that for years, but I guess, you know, uh, I mean, I was aware of Bosch at the time, but that didn't turn me on that much. Like I'm much more interested in the way a painting is made, you know, the way, the way all the parts of a painting come together to create meaning. I'm not, I'm much less interested in the meaning that derives from subject matter. You know, when I was talking to a young painter who I really like recently, and they were very, um, no, they were clearly, I don't think they said this, but they were clearly very concerned with subject matter. And I just remember thinking that that really doesn't interest me. I shouldn't say at all anymore, because that couldn't be true. Um, but I'm really interested, you know, I'm much more moved both, intellectually and emotionally by form yeah but that doesn't mean but i just to be clear that doesn't mean you know i don't want to be mean i don't want to mention names but i just saw a, a, a show a small retrospective of an artist who's one of those painters who a lot of painters respect and not a terribly famous artist but he's well known to painters and the show you know, it's an artist who is clearly interested in a kind of idea about pictorial structure. But the pictorial structure to me seemed so um, received and conventional that that's not at all what I'm interested in. Like, I don't mean, when I say formalism, I don't mean just fulfilling some kind of conventional idea of pictorial structure. It's more complex and um, you know, more difficult to pinpoint exactly what it is. Yeah. If that it, makes sense. I, I totally, I, I know what you mean. It's funny though, when you describe it as like, I can see that, you know, the figure, uh, I mean, enough figurative, mo a lot of the work Yeah, is the vehicle for the painting and like working out the image and how you're doing it and the way you see it. But at the same time, there's, there's so much of the work is there's humor in there and there's the subject matter is often iconic in a way that you can't see the image just as a formal image. So it's bouncing that extreme sort of dedication to the formal ways of the making of the image with the idea that people have about these certain people. And sure. not all of them are like that. There's a lot that are anonymous, but there are some that are... You know, and unfortunately, you know, if you paint someone that's well known, that's going to be an image that gets out there a lot more. It gets reproduced or talked about a little more than, you know, an anonymous figure who's just. Yeah, you know no, that's I mean? true. I mean, when you say iconic, you're talking about my painting specifically, just to be clear. Yes, right? yeah. yeah. Certain people, like if you paint the president, I mean, yeah. that's someone you, you can't not know. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I, I, I came to this. That's certainly true. And I, I came to this um, realization about my work recently. A couple of years ago, 
you know, I teach at Queens College, and the faculty at Queens College were asked to give brief presentations of their work. I think we were given like five minutes. So I thought to myself, okay, like what's really important to me? What am I going to say in five minutes? And it made me realize that when I, gave, when I would typically give an artist talk, I wasn't totally honest. I wasn't trying to deceive anybody. But I would talk about my work as if I had an idea, and then I executed that idea. That's always the way I presented my work. But I realized that that's really not how I made my work. You know, I would, I would start with, uh, you know, a kind of vague idea. So, like with the Cary Grant paintings, I did start by thinking, wouldn't it be funny to paint Cary Grant nude? But that's about all I thought about. And I started making the painting. And then as I was making it, I started thinking about, okay, the male nude, you know, the male nude today at a time when most painters of the figure, or at least the well-known ones, are doing the female nude. You know, and I thought about sexuality, and I, it, I became interested in the way um, viewers make assumptions about the sexuality of the artist based on the image, and that became interesting to me. So that's all content. But those are all things that I sort of think about as I'm making the painting. What really drives me in making all of my work is... I, you know, I'm interested in this form, and for me, the, the particular form is traditional representation. And the question for me always is, how am I going to modify that form so that the viewer hopefully looks at it as if they've never encountered that form before? That's primarily what motivates me. And I think that's, a form, that's formalism for me, or at least I think yeah. about it as formalism. No, I know exactly what you're saying. It's like, you know, and, and essentially all image making does that in a sense. Like it's I the think removal so. of yeah. it from reality and then what does that say? And that is a big sliding bar, you know, where where it can... Like when I was looking at your work yesterday, thinking about talking to you, the one thing that I, for, for some reason, this might be, you know, on the note or it might work or not but I, I was thinking about like how tvs have gotten so much better in like the last 10 years right like remember when you first started seeing the high definition tvs that looked almost like more real than life yeah they do yeah maybe because we're just so used to seeing images on the tv have mm -hmm. that blurriness and that reproduction and that was a that's a weird thing when you like look at tv and you're like are they in there or like wait that's more crystal clear than if i'm looking at someone's face in a room Right, sure. And that's a bizarre kind of like hyper real, non real relationship that my brain like, you know, has a difficult time like negotiating in a uh -huh. way, you know? Yeah. And I think when I was thinking about your paintings, sometimes in the paintings everything is so crisp, no matter whether it's far away in the background or it's the foreground, there's almost like this hyper real like there's not the blurriness necessarily that you would get in your peripheral vision and there's something really interesting about that it's almost like bringing it all up to the level of you're looking at it all instantaneously even though you can't do that with your eyes which is yeah. a big gap between reality and that image that you make and it be to me it becomes a really interesting not only in looking at it but also conceptually in thinking about the way we process like reality and what is real. And in the midst of all the crap that's going on nowadays, that's a really big pertinent question. It's like, what is real? Oh, you know what I mean? Like what is, you know, reproduced images? What, what is it doing to us? Or what is, how are we negotiating our existence through simulacra? You right. know, like just even doing a conversation like this over the computer as opposed to in person is so different but here we are, and we're talking to each other. Right. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, all of those questions really interest, interest me, although, you know, the question of what is realism is probably an unresolvable question. You know, it, it just it leads to nothing but um, unsatisfactory answers, probably, which is fine. I mean, you know, and I think that's probably where, you know, the richness of the pursuit of realism comes from. But, um, yeah, that that kind of hyper focus is something that I don't exactly intend to be in my work. And I've actually tried to eliminate it from the work, but never very successfully because it, um, it bothers me sometimes because it, I, I don't know why this bothers me, but 
the artifice, I mean, that leads to a kind of artifice in my work. And I, that bothers me in my work, although it shouldn't because the artists I love are artists who work with that same kind of artifice. <laughs> so it's, I, I don't know what, I don't know what my hang up is. And you're making art, which is short for artifice, right, which is right. all about we're making something that's not real. So, but I know what you mean. Sometimes you want to blur that line a bit. You know what I mean? Or we all have. I think you know. I have this hang up in my work where it's it's not really flat, right? But in reproduction, it looks very flat. Like people think, oh, that's like seamless. He's just making flat right. paintings. Yeah. When you see him in person, there's a lot going on there. And I'm tired of always saying like, actually, if you go see the work in person, there's all this little stuff in there. And this, yeah. and it almost becomes more physical in a way because it's subtle and, and it's not just throwing thick, goopy paint to where it looks physical. It's actually physically built up in a way that you could see when you see it in person. So, you know, I can't get really get hung up on that because I am working that way and I know that they're going to be reproduced. So it's part of it. But I think we all have this thing where like, well, I want my work to, it's always slightly to be interpreted slightly differently than it is. Or right. this is what I'm trying to get at, but people get at it a different way. And then if we had a real problem with that, then what the hell are we doing making pictures and showing other people pictures? We would just write an essay. Right. Sure. That's the gift is that it can be interpreted in so many different ways. You know, like you might not have thought when making the work that I would, in my mind, go into that whole, you know, simulacra, like thinking about like televisions and how crisp things have gotten and all that stuff. But for me, it was really interesting to go there. You know what I mean? And at the same time, I go back to the work and I'm interested in the work and how it's made and the person and like the image and, you know, how that makes me feel. I never forget... I don't know, God, I don't know what year this was, but I walked into an armory fair on the piers, you know, and there was, one, there was a big painting of yours hanging, like kind of as you walk in that left side. And I, like, I almost fell over because it was so impactful. It was the, where it was, it was the scale. Oh, thanks. That's and nice. it was just like a gut punch. And I was like, all right, well, that I got my money's worth. <laughs> <laughs> I just it? walked in the door, which... I don't normally get at art fairs. Sometimes I'm like, well, this feels like a carnival. But yeah, I don't go you really, anymore. You but... really, yeah, you really knocked it out of the park with that one. Oh, thanks. But the problem with you doing that is, you know, it's people like you who create these art fair, like, you know, <laughs> like people try to do that. Your painting just happened to be that strong and that impactful on its own that it, it worked in the midst of a sea of like, you know, an orchestra of like, noise of art but now we see at art fairs that people are trying to make that work like artists where it doesn't make sense to make work like that but they're trying to make work that's just like a one-hit wonder that will stand out amidst all this other noise you know what i mean yeah i suppose that's true and i know what you mean thinking about it now you know thinking about some people's installations that i've seen in reproduction at art fairs but i i really do not go anymore i just can't look at art that way yeah, I mean, some people say I should go, but I I haven't been to an art fair in I think twenty years. Well, some people fifteen should, maybe. Some people probably tell you you should try certain drugs or you should try <laughs> <laughs> you should try Pilates. Yeah, but we're not going to just do everything people right. tell me. <laughs> yeah, maintaining it's, my Instagram account is enough. <laughs> yeah, isn't it funny? Like, I feel like as as you get older you make concessions. There's like, there's lines. You're like, all right, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going, I'll do Instagram, but I'm not going to do Snapchat yeah, or whatever. For you sure. know what I mean? You have uh -huh. to draw the line somewhere. Yeah. But yeah, art fairs, it's, it's kind of a strange, it's, it's a, they're great in the sense too, that you could see a lot of work you normally wouldn't see. You know what I mean? Because it's almost like a Spotify mix. It's like, it's not the best way to hear music but you might get introduced to a couple records or bands that you That's never true. would have heard before. That's you true. Know? So I mean, and that's that, the good with the bad. You're making a good case to go. No, to I'm not trying. <laughs> I know you're Stay not trying home. to, but you are. <laughs> <laughs> Stay home. I I always go home from an art fair thinking, you know, I just went to the art mall, right? Which yeah. is not like, which is funny because nowadays, whenever I do visit my 
extended family and we happen, which it's not often, but when I go to a mall, I actually like going to the mall now where I'm like, oh, this is kind of fun. Could like, you know, you have a kid and you can go bowling and then you can go buy a shirt and you can eat and then you leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, and that just made me realize we, we go to the mall so infrequently now. Is that, I mean, we I, really do. I can't remember the last time I went to a mall. I think it depends where you are. Like if you're out somewhere where there's no options, people go to the mall because that's where you go see a movie. That's where you go eat. That's true. You know, we're we're yeah. kind of blessed in a way to have like, a, I mean, New York in general is, you know, it's a yin and a yang. I mean, there's what's amazing about it. You can eat around the globe. You can see all this artwork. You go to museums and then you got to deal with all the other stuff. You know, you live out in the middle of nowhere you don't have that culture necessarily, but you know, it's, you can drive up to the store and park in a parking lot and throw your bags in the trunk and you don't have to carry them on the subway and <laughs> deal with all that stuff. Yeah. But even so, I feel like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I was living in New York, but malls were still more part of my life. I guess it's just, oh, yeah? I think so. You know, like when I would come here, you know, I'm here at, um, in my mother's house, um, I feel like I used to go to malls more when I would come here, but I just don't do that anymore. I think a lot of malls have died, for one thing. Yeah, that's true. Well, it was, I mean, there were movies, right, in the 90s, like Mall Rats. I mean, yeah. Yeah, there was, it was a culture back right. then. Yeah, like, that, it was the thing to do. Yeah, I think that culture has disappeared. I guess everyone knows that. Um, I also never go to well, movies anymore. So Yeah, I don't really go much at all either, to be honest. I mean, well, and also COVID kind of destroyed a lot of stuff, but I think that Mall of America, is it called Mall of America? The one in in Minnesota? Yeah, Minnesota. Uh When I read about that and it's so big and there's so much like flora and fauna in there that it creates weather patterns, I was like, that might be, (laughs) I mean, I was into the biosphere thing. I thought that was kind of cool, but it's a little weird when it's, you know, your shopping experience. (laughs) <laughs> and then that you know cruise hilarious. ships which are malls on the sea right. where you can you was know, the, get sick and you can surf at the same time was <laughs> the indoor part the weather initiative. was the indoor weather at the mall of america unintentional or did they design that i never heard that it was intentional i i'm guessing that it just was happenstance that you know That's the so thing funny. was covered and it was big and they had a lot of you know duck ponds and whatever uh-huh <laughs> Maybe it was a way to test out the biosphere in a more sort of realistic <laughs> social really engagement. Funny. It is. And, uh, but yeah, I, I do think some of those things have changed. I mean, I don't even, I don't know how you experience it, but you're talking about art fairs, but I don't go to galleries quite as much as I used to. I think COVID really affected that too, though. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 tr- you know, I, I, that's true. I, I, I actually have the last few years been designing a class where I bring my students to galleries. And um, that's in part to just get them out to see galleries. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it can be incredible, even in New York City, how, how many students don't go out and see the galleries in person. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's also a little bit, I have to admit, uh, a great way for me to, be, to have the opportunity to go do that. Um, so I think I've seen a fair amount. Well, it's a good idea. I mean, two birds with one stone. Yeah. And it's really important, I think, for students who are developing, like to see all that stuff in the flesh. Definitely. Because everything is seeable online. I mean, it's just a couple, few years ago, it just struck me as ridiculous that I was showing, you know, slides of uh, Rothko paintings or de Kooning paintings in Queens when we could be at MoMA, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, or for that matter, seeing contemporary art. So um, yeah, that is definitely a great thing about teaching in New York City. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, you know, where I teach in Pennsylvania, there's there's the museum at the college there, which is so important. But it, and it's great, but, you know, it is one place with the same work. Uh-huh. So you have an intimate relationship with that work because you're always seeing it. But, I mean, if you go to school in New York City... It's like you could just spend your whole bachelor's degree just going out to see galleries and museums. You could yeah, never work. for sure. <laughs> you could just be looking at stuff the whole time. There's, and it never ends, you know, which is kind of the a blessing and the curse of New York, too, is just never enough time to see it all. Yeah, no, you know? definitely. You're going to miss stuff. 
I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I know some critics who say they see every show, but that's their job. I mean, we would never paint yeah, I mean, if we were um, getting paid to do it. What is the museum at, at you, you teach at Penn state, right? Yeah. It's the Palmer the museum. Palmer? Of Art. Oh, yeah. Is it good? Yeah. It is good. It's really good. And they're actually building now a new museum that's, they got funding for it. That'll be a little further North on the campus that I think will be even obviously nice. It's, it's, this one has been around for a while. So, but yeah, the collection is great. There's a lot of really, I mean, as a student, it's funny when you, when you're going to a school that's not in a city like that, you know, the, those works that you see have like such an impact. So there was like a huge, um, there was a, a huge, oh, what was this? The, the biggest, oh, the Ed Paschke painting there was like crazy. Uh-huh. I mean, it was so bright and weird and funky that I will never forget that artist or that work. You know, yeah. it, it's funny how some of those things have um, a big effect on you. There was a really cool Alex Katz cutout, a Wayne Tebow that was amazing, a Philip Perlstein that any figurative painter would go bananas for. I mean, mm-hmm. it's such a cool composition. It was a great image. So, you know, there's like, I, I like to think of a relationship of that as like when I was younger, you know, I only had so many cassette tapes. So those tapes had, like, I really knew those records. You know what I right, mean? Or, yeah. like, the vinyl I had. I knew it because I didn't have Spotify. I didn't have the yeah, Endless. Right. That's right. So now I think it's it's more of, you know, sifting out those things that mean a lot to you. But back then it wasn't a choice. You just, you had what you had, and, you know, that meant a lot to you. Mm-hmm. I listened to... uh you know, Paula Abdul and LL Cool J way more than I probably wanted to because I just happened to have those cassette tapes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Were you a big music guy growing up? You know, I wasn't. And I have to admit, uh, to this day, I'm not a big music person. And, I, you know, I, I'm reluctant to say that because I feel it, you know, diminishes my humanity somehow just because so many people... <laughs> are so invested in music. You know, it's actually, a, I think, a pretty fascinating aspect of, I guess, culture since it probably started in the beginning of the 20th century, but how, um, you know, how widespread the love of music is, which I actually don't think was always the case. I mean, it was obviously not always the case because music wasn't accessible for a long time, yeah. except to very few. So that really fascinates me. It fascinates me, you'll, you'll often find people who say that they're not interested in art, they think that art is insignificant and a kind of, you know, unnecessary distraction. You know, I, that's probably a kind of American attitude. You encounter it quite a bit. But, you know, but then they say they love Led Zeppelin, you know, and it right. mean, it's, their, you know, it, it's made their life meaningful. You know, so they somehow don't think of music as an art form, but... It, it, I'm not that interested in music, but I'm interested in how important music is to people. Right. Yeah, well, if you think about also the cultural connection, you know, outside of America where music, a lot of times music is part of the culture, like growing up, it's part of like ritual, uh-huh. or, you know, whether it's dance or like there's, it's just ingrained in it. I mean, America's kind of new, you know what I mean? Right. So with art, American art, I mean, it was brought over like when the first, if you think about it, the first really, well, maybe, I don't know if I could say this. You would be better at telling me if this is, you know, BS or not. But I feel like the most significant sort of like movement of quote unquote American art was probably abstraction, right? The ab- abstract expressionists. Yeah, I mean, I, that's certainly the typical narrative, and that's probably true. Well, to where the mass public are like, okay, this is American art. Because, like, right. no, what was true. it before? Like, you know, Thomas Hart Benton or th- people like that. Like, that didn't really make the, the cultural impact that, you know, the American painters like Pollock and de Kooning or, you know, well, de Kooning, but, you know, that kind of work. So it, at that point, people are seeing like Pollock and they're like, well, what a, my kid could do this. You know what I mean? Whereas, like, music in the cultural history of America it came from other places but it was so ingrained into our culture from early on with like ragtime and jazz and blues and it really became a soundtrack so to speak to 
the development of our country in a way. Whereas art, I think it was maybe a little more imported or it wasn't quite as direct. I mean, I'm, tr- I'm getting historical about things I have no qualifications to talk about, but... No, I think that's you know, true. And, you know, America also started out as a, um, as a Puritan, or at least, you know, the European tradition in America started out as a Puritan tradition, which was suspicious of visual art. Yeah. And probably of music too, but you know, in on the margins of American culture, a very rich musical history developed, and you know, which has informed you know all music in American, uh, all American music. So I, I think that's true, and then that coincided with um, the development of technology that allowed music to be widely distributed. That's exactly what I was going to say, because records started being made. Yeah. And now the Puritan desire to squash, you know, rock and roll couldn't catch up with the dissemination of rock and roll. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it became the soundtrack of the country in a way. Mm-hmm. And whereas art, I don't think, had that power of dissemination. You know what I mean? How was it going to do that, really? Right. It's not a, an art form that can be so easily or successfully disseminated that way. I mean, it yeah. can be, but it's not, but it, you know, the, your experience of it is diminished. And, well, and, maybe it did too in sense of like cartoons or comics or things that are more commercially disseminated, you know, that could be distributed sure. in that way. Yeah. But if we're thinking about like, you know, Jackson Pollock, I mean, you're either going to the gallery or the museum to see that or it's not like really finding its way to you on a postcard or something that you know 12 year olds are putting up in the room but it also but you know cartoons or or movies or television that requires you know for the most part invested engagement right it, to yeah. watch a cartoon you have to sit there and watch it where music you can have it on in your car you can have it in the background it can be you know it it can accompany a party. I mean, it's a, it's much more able to become completely absorbed into all aspects of life. Right. It's the guy at the party against the wall doesn't say much, but he's always there, and somehow he's just always invited in yeah. because no one really notices. Yeah. I mean, I have to be honest with you, that drives me, I, not being that interested in music, it, it kind of drives me crazy. I feel like we can't escape music. And, right. um, you know, like you know, on the subways. I mean, it's just everywhere all the time. Um, and yeah, I, I, sometimes I find myself getting to be a little bit of a curmudgeon about that. <laughs> Did you grow up with not a lot of music in the house? I guess not. No, my mother didn't. My mother did have one record that, I, no, she had two records that I remember. One was Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto. And the other was My Fair Lady with Rex Harrison. And um, so we didn't listen to a lot of music. You know, I had some musical interest as a high school student, but I didn't have a lot of friends as a high school student. And um, I didn't have much of a social life, which I know that sounds tragic, but it really wasn't. It didn't bother me. Um, So I didn't have that exposure to music you know i think for a lot of people it comes through a social context but you know i was interested in like the i like the beatles i don't know how it, how common it was to like the beatles in the 80s um and i had weird musical tastes like i liked jim croce remember him who's jim croce jim croce was a a, a musician in the 70s his biggest hit was bad bad leroy brown Oh, yeah, yeah. He okay. died in like 73. Um, but, and then I, you know, I mentioned that that portrait painter I studied with, and um, he was, he loved music, and he played the piano, and he, um, he, I remember him telling me that, um, you know, you'll you'll listen to the Beatles and you'll love the Beatles, and then you'll move on to Count Basie and you'll love Count Basie, and then you'll move on to Bach. And you know, he was you know he had a very obviously that's a very traditional idea of musical taste and development. Um, and I was actually thinking about this recently because I I listened to your interview with Dominique Fung and you were talking about classical music 
and and you were both talking about how classical music is associated with or it's there's a perception of i think you were saying class mm-hmm. um but i was thinking that actually with this teacher of mine it wasn't really a class issue like he he was italian and his parents were italian immigrants and you know music was an important part of their um family life but they were you know they were immigrants they were working class i think there was just a different cultural relationship to classical music yeah and um so my musical interest since then has pretty much been european classical music although i'm not you know i i don't listen all the time i I will listen now and again and there are certain things i love but it my interest i think comes out of him you know him that teacher of mine his name was clement micarelli and um you know that's really where my musical interest started but even there i i listen rarely i feel like i listen very intensely but rarely yeah and i think that well, I don't know, you can answer this. That seems like just the setting of experience in the music in that way is slightly academic in the sense that this is a teacher. You know yeah, what I mean? And this sure. is what they listen to. Whereas it's not like your older brother being like, this This new like Kinks record is where it's at. And this girl I know likes it, so I like it. You know what I mean? It's like a different... You, I think we all have different like entryways into music. You know, my dad growing up always played Motown, so uh-huh. I feel soul music. Like I, I have a connection with the way he felt when he listened to it and the way he expressed that and sang it. So I, it, it through osmosis, I feel like I got that. You know what I mean? So when I listen to classical music, we never listened to classical music. It was never around. I never went anywhere. The only time I ever heard classical music was like maybe at some event at the Carnegie Museum or something like that. And it felt like it was tied to that kind of experience, which I didn't really experience much. Right. So I think that's just where I am with the way I feel about music is how I grew up with it and what it meant to me in, in relation to you know culture and my friends and my experiences. And we all have an anchor in a way of what that is you know with music because in in, to your point music just goes into you it's not necessarily like you'll hear it at a party you'll hear led zeppelin it's not like people are saying to you like okay now we're all going to sit around and listen to this record together and this is what it means and this is how you're supposed to feel whereas with art you go to a gallery or museum and it's like here's what the artist is trying to do and this is what it means and this is what abstraction it you know yeah. That doesn't happen with music as much. It's more of just a visceral thing that's there. Yeah, I mean, and of course, that's something that certain critics have bemoaned about the, the history of music in the 20th century. You know, like Adorno, you know, that horrified him, that people, that music was a passive experience for most people. Right, right, that's true. And, and um, yeah. I mean, you know, he was such a weirdo that he, I, I mean, I read this essay where, you know, he talks about his, his love of Beethoven six symphony which he tries to revisit every year but he doesn't listen to it he reads the score (laughs) 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 and um but that's appreciation yeah um (laughs) i was gonna what was i gonna say about that no you're absolutely right that my interest in music had a kind of academic source it came from a teacher but i also remember you know that was in that would have been in late high school and i was in that in that sort of first period of finding myself very moved by my experience with certain works of art. You know, like that's when I first discovered Aang, um, you know, or any of the artists I was looking at at that time. You know, and, you know, I felt like I had been exposed to a way of experiencing life that I had never experienced. Yeah. And just the way my teacher talked about classical music, it seemed to offer that promise. Although, you know, when you first listen to classical music, that it doesn't deliver. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to listen over and over right. again. Yeah, yeah. But that, the promise of that is something that I, I sort of knew that I wanted. 
Um, and I was exposed to that through him. Um, now, I, I, I want to be clear about something. I don't, I don't in any way mean to suggest that classical music is the best music or it's the only way that can be experienced. That was just my, my experience with it. Yeah, it's really about what everyone gets out of the thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I listen to classical music, and I, I love it. It makes me feel a certain way. And there's certain times when I want to hear that. You know, just like Philip Glass. Like, I'll listen to Philip Glass if I'm in the mood and I want to hear that music. And it makes me feel a certain way. I'm not listening to it in a passive sense of just, like, hanging around washing dishes listening to, you know, Philip Glass for an hour. But right. You know, there's different ways, different portals, different ways people enter in or engage with creative stuff, you know, and some people like ourselves, artwork does it for them and they do like that. I mean, I love that quote that you were, that you were talking about, like, how dare you muddy the uh, ingestion of creative material by it just being something in the background, right. like Muzak yeah. or something, yeah. you know, like the poster of... I always joke around and like, do you ever think Hooksai would have thought for a million years that his print of the wave would be on people's mugs as they're like having their breakfast coffee? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I wonder what he it, would have thought, yeah. I know, right? Like people in America are just hanging around with like the wave cup. Or, so, yeah. you know, there's something to be said for that, that that's what's great about artwork is it, it while some people think that makes it elitist or academic or like who cares or, uh, you know, uh, and other people like ourselves say there's something really to be gained about really engaging in that image and thinking about it separate from any other experience, just walking in and yeah. thinking about that. It's, it's, it is a luxury, you know, and to the point of what you were saying before, it can be superfluous. Like it's not essential for our existence necessarily to survive as a species, but it is what separates us from, you know, rabbits running around in the yard, you know, is that, we can sit there and stare at a picture and talk about it and think about ourselves or, you know, I think it's really what it gets. I mean, it's, maybe it's bold to say, but I think it gets to what makes us who we are as a species, you know, that art is, is kind of like the highest form or maybe the most purified form of that thinking and that, that sort of sensibility. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would unapologetically agree with you. <laughs> you know, I, well, it I, makes I us feel better about going to the studio tomorrow. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or Whereas other people are like, you're just selfish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just well, go sit in your box and make your paintings. and yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, or, you know, we go to the studio and then we realize that we're not living up to all those people who did all that. That means so much Oh, yeah. Well, I gave up on that a long time ago. <laughs> I have to say, that still torments me. Oh really? You're, yeah, I, yeah. No, I, I'm unencumbered by that desire or <laughs> ambition. I do feel occasionally like when I first went to school, I was a pre med major, and I do one once in a while think, well, I could be a surgeon right now, or a doctor, and I'm just in a room making pictures. But I yeah. feel like this is where I can make my the world a better place in some minuscule fashion. You, you know? were a pre med student. Yeah, I started oh, yeah. off in pre medicine. Uh, but it just wasn't, I wasn't that into it. And I felt like, well, I think you got to be into it if you're going to do this. Oh, yeah, I would serious. think. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, do you want a half ass surgeon working on you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Dreaming of Rothko's while right. I was like <laughs> separating your rib cage. <laughs> Have you had the experience I, of like going to a doctor or a lawyer and you tell them you're an artist and they say, wow, that I would love to be an artist. Has that ever happened to you? Not once. Although. Really? Huh never That's but i've had times. doctors and dentists who collect work and appreciate art uh-huh but never said like oh i wish i could do that huh that's, but that's just my tw at least twice with art do I'm they say doctors. that in the sense that do you think they really want to make images or they want to be like oh i'm an artist i go paint all day i you feel know, like they of, well probably there's they, they had a very romantic idea of what it is to be an artist but I, fe I mean, my impression was that they weren't really happy in what they were doing. Yeah. And they thought, yeah. you know, to them, being freedom. an artist and, you know, especially like being able to make some money at it. Yeah, it seemed like a kind of freedom that they didn't have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the grass is always greener. Yeah, I you suppose. Know? It's, uh, th th I feel that is so 
true and frustrating as an artist when people are like oh it must be so nice to have no rules you just go in there and you do what you want to do and that's the hardest part about it is yeah, no one's sure. telling you what you need to do right other than like make some work for a show so it's carte blanche it's like all up to you you know if you work on a film crew you know unless you're the director even the director probably doesn't make every single decision there's a casting director there's a director of photography there's like you know it's a collaborative of in that creative field it's not just one person and their vision usually as an artist it's just you and your idea and then you put it out there and you want people to pay attention to it yeah i mean it's I mean, not it's, easy it's incredibly hard i was i was just talking to jeffrey deitch about that you know it's people who people have to be incredibly motivated to be successful as artists because Definitely. there's no one there telling you you have to keep going right that is that is so true and maybe i'm getting old but now more than ever because there's so many distractions yeah, there's no so kidding. many other things to do you could bump into your phone for four hours uh, believe me and then you happened. put it down and you're like <laughs> yeah you put it down and you're like shit i should have been painting yeah no for sure <laughs> I mean, I and mean, you have kids, right? I mean, that, you know, as one. you get older and you have one kid. Um, Singular. <laughs> you know, just the responsibilities of, you know, being part of a family, that, that's a distraction too. So, it gets, you know, for me, it's just gotten harder and harder to maintain focus. Yeah. Do you have a family? I have two kids, yeah. Two? Yeah. How, and are they younger or older? Like, have you gone through well, the gauntlet? No, my kids are... 19 and 22 okay. um i haven't really i mean it's you know i remember thinking when my son was first born that you know okay i only have 18 years you can do this <laughs> but it doesn't end at 18 and uh uh really you're gonna throw that on me sorry i have a teenager can you sorry. pretend <laughs> i guess it, i guess it varies um but um my son also has autism so you know he's um, you know, I'm, I'm always there for him. So, yeah. um, but even still, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it ends at 18. No, I did. Isn't it funny though, as a parent, I mean, you've been through it twice, every level, certain things get easier and, and you check off certain things and then other things pop up. It's just always evolving. Yeah. But to me, I think the major gift of it and also the thing that's challenging is you're never, I mean, if, if you care if you have any empathy as a parent, you, you're you never free of that. Like you're always thinking about that person or those people. You Absolutely, know what I mean? They, yeah. They, it, it's, it's like this, it's wonderful because you become hopeful, ideally like not selfish, but it's also can be exhausting in a sense that you never feel like I'm always thinking, looking like, oh, what, you know what I mean? You're, it's completely exhausting. And I, um, like I'm a single parent. And so I, um, you know, I, I'm a single soul income parent. And so I'm often um, just doing what, you know, whatever varied things come up in, you know, the demands of having two kids, you know, and that can take up my whole morning, you know, into the early yeah. afternoon. So I get to the studio at, I don't know, one or two, you know, so I have to stay there till 10 or 11, but, you know, just those demands, and it's not physical labor, but I find that exhausting. You know, so yeah. I can often get to the studio exhausted, which is another dilemma. It is. And as the years go by, it doesn't get any easier, right? Although I do think we do get a little better at maybe managing our time. I think about those days yeah. before I had a family and stuff, and I would just like dilly dally, you know, it's like, whatever, I have all day. And, and now, you know, I'm definitely more like, okay, I can I get stuff done, you know? Yeah, I think that's true. You know, I think I've actually always been more productive when I've had some outside constraint. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Again, it's the thing that's like, it's easier like when you have someone telling or or if you have a deadline, like when you have a show deadline, like, okay, it's like I, I'm working towards that date. Sometimes when that's not there, you're a little more... Uh, it, yeah you you're more lazy times. <laughs> yeah you're like out um, of time yeah and uh you know of course that has a certain like it's it's only helpful up to a point at a certain point you know if you just don't have any time anymore you can't yeah, it's debilitating yeah. right? Of course. but no i think that can be beneficial those constraints that's like 
when you're older trying to pull like late nights, it's only beneficial to a point to yeah, where, right. you know, you're making bad decisions or you're like holding the brush with your toes and you're like, wait, how did I get to this point? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I sometimes also, you got to get some sleep. I also, I don't, I think you're younger than me. I'm 55. Are you younger? Yeah, I'm 47. 47. Okay. So I don't, I feel like the older I get, the less I just want to do those, you know, like, um, mad rushes to get a show done you know I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I i'm less interested now in staying up until 2 or 3 a.m um i think that's just aging i i i'm already there like i i can't work past a certain time anymore yeah or uh, like i'm just not productive it slows to a snail's pace so it's better for me to just get to sleep and get in there the next day and work at it but yeah and i find myself being overly prepared like i don't want to have anxiety about getting things done on a deadline or whatever so like i have an upcoming show in march and that work's done i mean i'll probably do a couple more things for it but to get the catalog ready and to to prepare like i've made that work and that work took me a while so i i i make sure that i'm on i hate cramming i was like that with tests and stuff too i don't want to because like if i stay up trying to cram I can't remember any of the material. Yeah, the work suffers. Terrible on the test. Yeah. Is that show with Miles? It is. Yeah, I have a feeling when my show comes up, he's not going to be as pleased with me being finished (laughs) so early. (laughs) My work takes so long. Because actually my work shouldn't take as long as it does, even though it's labor intensive. There's some sensibility issue with me um, that always leads me to, you know, I always you know, again, down to the wire. And I, I actually know that used to bother Jeffrey Deitch when I was showing with him. He was always very um, good about it. Like, he never complained. But I know it used to bother yeah, him. Yeah, that's because you're, you're delivering great work, though. That's why. Oh, that's nice of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, too, let's be honest, I, I mean, you may feel that you're not as efficient as you could be or something, but your work probably demands a lot of time and i mean my work is a lot quicker i can use a hair dryer <laughs> like i'm i work faster uh-huh. i'm more of the alex katz ilk where like i don't spend i mean i don't do a painting in a day but you know i, I work quicker uh-huh. and yeah. you know certain people the the process needs more time to breathe it takes more time and you never have to tell anyone that you should be quicker or whatever because the way your work looks and how the attention to it, it, like you can tell people it takes you, you know, two years to make a painting and I don't think anyone would have a beef. <laughs> you got to milk yeah. that. I still wish I was faster. I think, but, we, yeah, I had a, I had a friend in graduate school who was a basically photorealist. I mean, he was, he painted beautifully at a snail's pace and he would get so frustrated that he couldn't work quicker, you know? Mm-hmm. So he tried to change the work to be a little more graphic and less, you know, feathering and less blur, you know, and it, it just wasn't his work. He went back to the way yeah. he, he worked and it drove him nuts. Yeah. You know? I mean, that actually happened to me too. I, in, in the, you know, when I first saw Alicia Scavage and John Curran in the, when was that nineties, you know, mid nineties, yeah. I decided I was going to work faster. Um, but I just didn't like the work, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with those yeah. paintings being out there. So who's your friend? Yeah. My friend, his name was Steve Walls. He passed uh-huh. away. He was my best friend. He oh, passed away uh, I'm sorry to hear years that. back. Um, but yeah, he was uh, an amazing artist. His, his paintings were really beautiful. And he never really, I don't think he got the attention he should have gotten. But uh-huh. I think it was hard because, you know, he had a family and like it took him time to make that work. And sometimes your your life isn't always set up for yeah, having no that amount of right. time, which for really sure. makes it hard, you know. Um, you know, it's, I, you know, another painter I love is David, and I was looking recently at his um, Death of Marat, and those, yeah, those guys were actually very efficient. Like, when you really look at that painting, I, I don't think that painting took him that long. You know, I think yeah. that kind of efficiency, it's rare to see that in artists. I mean, in wor- I artists think- working with traditional representation. Right, right. Yeah, I bet I bet Manet was like that too. Oh, I mean, for sure. Yeah, know, but I mean, did you ever see that painting he did called Suicide? 
It's like a, a figure laying on the bed with... Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it looks like he knocked it out in like 10 minutes. Sure, definitely. You know? But sometimes people who labor over things are so good at it that it, they make it look easy, but it's really hard, and then vice versa. You know, sometimes um, people will labor something. It, it's just, you never know. It's, everyone has their own working methods and stuff, so... You yeah. Know. No, absolutely. I mean, I don't like this artist, even though more and more people seem to be embracing him. But you know the painter Bouguereau, the 19th century yeah. painter? Yeah, yeah. He was apparently very fast. You know, he did something like 800 paintings in the course of his life, and some of those are big Damn, paintings. That's, yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. Um, well, Bob Ross was fast, too. Yeah. <laughs> and he made gorgeous scenes. <laughs> I had, a, I had a student recently who um, was, what was I doing? I was showing him like a better way to clean his brush in the turpentine. And then he said to me, um, shouldn't I just, oh, now I'm forgetting it. The Bob Ross saying about how to clean oh, his brush. Oh, beat the devil out of it? Shouldn't I just beat the devil out of it? And I yeah, had no idea what he meant. And he was laughing. Brush. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. The sad part is that supposedly that's what killed him is that he was working with that turpentine and every time he would do that with the brush, did you watch that documentary? No. Every time he would take the brush and beat the devil oh, out of yeah. it on that metal Makes pipe, sense. it aerosoled the, right. the, the stuff and he would breathe it in and that messed him up. Did they, has that been determined actually? That that I don't know. I uh, I don't uh, I'm sh I don't think they could prove that maybe uh -huh. necessary. I I just vaguely remember them mentioning something to that. Fact. No, but it makes sense because at, since my student told me that I've I've watched a few of those videos and um, there's actually there's a ten hour mix of him beating the devil out of his brush on it's YouTube. Like, it's <laughs> like watching a snuff film. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, but I but it's so clearly bad practice. You yeah. know when you see that. Right, and he's probably working with turpentine. Like probably, now, there's turpenoids yeah. and yeah. like eco-friendly stuff. Back yeah. then, I mean, when I went to art school, you know, I switched to acrylics after a couple of years because I was getting these bad headaches, and I just. And back then, it was like open season. There were just people had giant vats of turp oh, that was yeah. open, and, and the place stunk to high heaven. There was no uh, ventilation at all. I mean. And that know, used it's to changed a lot. You know, you were you were very conscious walking into the art schools when that they smelled like turpentine. I actually loved the smell, uh, but yeah, I know it like drives some people crazy. It. Yeah, yeah, it's the smell of brain cells fading. Off. Yeah, I mean, I don't use it anymore, but I, I did for a long time. Yeah, no, I used it too, and that was just you know par for the course back then. Right. But thankfully, now you know we have much eco it's way more eco-friendly you know and yeah and i mean it, everything's gotten a lot better it's funny that now if a student brings in like a small container of true damar varnish which has to have turpentine in it um you know you immediately know it it just it's oh, immediately yeah. present and they're they're Definitely. not allowed to use them in the art schools i teach in is turpentine allowed where you teach not at all. Yeah. And we actually, now we actually provide the, the eco house, like that, uh -huh. the eco friendly turpentine. And we have very specific containers that yeah. are containers you have to keep them in. Right. Yep. It is the exact, and I went to Penn State as an undergraduate. That's part of the reason I teach there. It's where I went to undergrad. And, you know, it is the exact opposite of what it was like back then, you know. Yeah. I mean, Queens College isn't quite that extreme, but I've seen, I've been in schools where it is. Yeah, we're pretty tight with it. I mean, it, it was loose for a long time, but they're very sustainable and like eco-friendly now. And, you know, we've kind of created a, I feel much better about the students working in those conditions, you know, than. Yeah, than sure. Than. That's true. Uh, do you use, when you say the eco-friendly, do, do you mean those thinners that are kind of milky looking? No, they're just, they're clear. They're citrusy. They're, clear, okay. they're called like terpenoid. And uh -huh. it, it's like terp, but it's just apparently not okay. quite as brutal. Yeah. Yeah, I, honestly, I use Gamsol. I, I, stopped, I stopped using oils back in school, so I just use acrylic. So I cut everything with you know matte medium or fluid mediums or water. So it's all water-based. And I know some of that stuff is still, you know, you don't want to drink it. It's not good for you. But, you know, it's, it's a little better as far as like the, the headaches and the aerosolization, I think, of it. 
You um, was that decision made though for aesthetic reasons, or was it for health reasons? It it was initially made for aesthetic reasons, uh-huh. and I noticed it that it really helped that uh-huh. I wasn't getting the headaches anymore. Huh. And then I asked once I started feeling a little better that I didn't have the turpentine turpentine in my studio. I started using these little craft paints that you would get at like Michael's because uh-huh. I was using the same paints that my mom would use at home. Like, so it was kind of conceptual. I was making these paintings based on my home and I was using those paints and then I switched out of oil and then I started feeling a little better. So I asked to move to another room where there was no oil painting being done and the headaches went away. Hmm. Like I, I felt much better. Yeah, it's interesting. I knew a lot of people who would get headaches from the turpentine. That never happened to me. I think it's it can vary from person to person how they react yeah. to that stuff. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, different you know symptoms and different. And maybe those headaches were caused by you know being dehydrated because I was on a steady diet of coffee and nothing else in school. I didn't eat. Uh, right. Yeah. But I definitely psychologically I felt better. You know when oh. I got out of that stink but you could smell it you know it was like very strong so yeah no turpentine has has measurable um you know health impact for sure i mean it can affect people's skin and it's not good stuff it smells good but it's not yeah yeah it's like nostalgic for me now it's like that's a nostalgic smell yeah like i love going to see a show with like thick oil paint and you smell it in the gallery. Right. Yeah. I, I love that smell. That happened to me recently with, um, I'm drawing a blank on her name, an artist who shows at James Cohen gallery. The show might still be up. Um, she does very, um, kind of simplified, almost cartoony images. Of oh, Grace women. Weaver. Grace Weaver. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could really smell the oil. Smell paint. It. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went to see, I'm going to forget, I forget his name. He's a Chinese artist who, I believe he shows at Pace, and he does these really thick impasto paintings that are almost like pixelated in a way, because, uh-huh. but when you stand back from them, they become images, but it's so thick, but that was like buttercream. I mean, that, that show had, you know, a real whiff of, of like sticking your face in the tube yeah. of oil paint, you know, it was pretty great. <laughs> so you're working, do you, are you working out here to do you? work between the two places it looks like you got some brushes those are my mother's oh. uh, that's yeah i'm in my mother's studio old studio so you're yeah. you strictly work in the city i yeah strictly at my studio in the city yeah do you ever sketch on like an ipad or any digital devices no you know i don't and i i wish i did because i have many friends who do it and it clearly you know provide so many advantages for them um i don't know you know how i would make the time to learn but i i wish i could do that you know i wish i had that skill i I never used to do it and i got an ipad pro and i started sketching on it and i was surprised at how fluid it is like it it feels pretty good you know and there's i mean it has its own thing but it's pretty intuitive and the pressure is so good. I mean, you know, cause I started working digitally, you know, in the early two thousands and drawing on the computer and uh-huh. messing with Photoshop to change my colors and stuff like that. And the, the advancements they've made from those days of those old tablets to like drawing on an iPad is like remarkable, you know, but yeah. the nice thing about that is like when you travel, it's so convenient. Like I take it when I visit my family and I could just knock out drawings. It's such a nice kind of like, tr- and, and you don't have to pack supplies. You just throw it in your bag and you're good to go. And you said you do that on iPad Pro? Yeah, because those are the ones that you can use the, the Apple Pencil. And uh-huh. there's a bunch of programs. I actually teach a digital painting class at Penn State because I've done it a lot. I do a lot of digital drawing and, you know, I use a lot of different programs and you know, some, there's so many now, like Procreate, and there's Illustrator Draw, there's Photoshop Draw Express, all these different programs. But they're all pretty intuitive as far as like you could just do a Conte sketch on there or, or just knock these things out really quickly. It's kind of fun, huh. you know. It's like a sketchbook that you can always take around with you. And, you know, yeah, I, sh- I should try it. I mean, I was thinking more about like I have friends who are very adept at well, Photoshop, but, um, you know, those modeling programs, I forget what they're called. Um, like Rhino and yeah, yeah all 3D those. Studio Max, all that. Yep. Yeah. 
And, um, you know, I have a friend who uses the program. It might be Rhino where you can start with a virtual lump of clay and make a sculpture. And he does that and then he lights the figures. And I mean, it's an incredible tool. I wish I, you know, I, I need to, you know, make the decision that I'm going to learn those things. Well, the, the beauty of the programs on that I use on the iPad, like procreate is just, it's just a blank piece of paper and a pencil or a yeah. pen. No, so it it's, it's fun. very, it's very straightforward, you know, mm-hmm. but you know, I, I feel like I may have working in paper collages and doing things like that. Maybe I've worked out of the sketchbook sort of like quality of my life where yeah, I think the only, for years, the only like drawing in that sense I was doing was like drawing my son a Pokemon every day for his lunch. Uh-huh, right. But then like, you know, it, I think that the digital media has made it, it, me jump back into just sketching more, which, you know, I don't really use for it. It's just, it's like exercising when it comes to like, you know, drawing or making art, which is kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. And do you work, last question, do you work in silence do you listen to radio interviews, podcasts, or do you do you listen to music ever when you work? I sometimes listen to music, but not not all not often. You know, now and again, I'll listen to music. And with me listening to music when I work, I'll put something on. You know, I will love it, but then I can't listen to anything again for quite a while. So. Um, I usually listen to things like in the past couple of years, I've been listening to true crime just because yeah. it's, um, it's easy enough to listen to that. And I, I've gotten used to the distraction of listening to something, uh, but I can't listen to um, like, I can't listen to novels being read because I, I never pay attention. I, you know, I lose right. the, the track, the, thread of the novel and I can't listen to lectures because again I, I can't maintain concentration on them um, isn't that a bummer because it's so hard to read because when you have time we're making visual things so we can't yeah, read so right. audiobooks seems like the solution but then you can't focus so I, do you I tried audiobooks but the other thing I don't like about audiobooks is I almost never like the way it's read right yeah that's tough almost never so um, that hasn't worked for me yeah, it's a that delivery pattern is is weird, right? It's like this yeah, and if it's, if it's overacted, it's you know for me really a problem. Um, I don't know that's but listening while I'm working, I've I, I feel a little spent on true crime. I don't know what I'm going to go to next. I feel like I've exhausted all options. Did you ever listen to Serial that podcast? I didn't listen to the first season. Isn't the second season the one? I think I listened to the second season. He defected from the army, like he was in Afghanistan and he defected. I didn't I listen to that second one. Season. The, first, the one. first and second season were really good. Huh. But I'm not, I, yeah, I don't listen to a lot of storytelling ones. I, I listen to more like interviewing ones, but uh, there was also the other one that was really good. I think it was called Last Scene and it was based on the Gardner Museum heist. Oh, that was amazing. I oh, loved it. Was it. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. I mean, really I, cool. I also loved that because that offered a glimpse into a Boston that does not exist anymore. Right. You know, like the, you know, the mobsters in Dorchester and that lawyer they interviewed who said he had that great line. He said that this wasn't pulled off by a couple of jamokes, you know, just like that kind of language. <laughs> right. Right. Um, I throwback. loved it. Yeah. You know, yeah, that was good. And then there was, wasn't there a Netflix special on it too yeah i thought they that did, wasn't as did. that wasn't as good i, I watched part yeah, of the that audio only ironically yeah it was for better an art thing was yeah. better mm-hmm. yeah it was well produced yeah i really loved that one yeah I, every once in a while one comes along yeah that was great um yeah i you know i those paintings must be destroyed don't you think oh i know right i, I yeah I, I wonder about that you know because like what happened like what i still can't figure out if it was an inside job or what the hell happened. Yeah. You know, I mean, I suppose, you know, the evidence seems pretty good that it was an inside job. You know, there's that evidence of the, of that one guard in question who was the only person who was in the room where I think the man, a painting was taken, but 
who would have that been stolen for? I mean, is it possible that it was really stolen for some billionaire who's just enjoying them in isolation? So weird, right? What a random, yeah. Like, it doesn't make any sense. I feel like they were stolen and then the criminals, you know, freaked out and destroyed them. I think we'll never oh, see them again. Yeah, that's and that Vermeer is so beautiful. Yeah, I, I, I mean that, I'd never been to that museum. And the, when I was listening to podcasts and then learning about it, what an amazing collection. It's such an anomaly, it feels like. It's because it's small, but yeah. there's just this amazing collection of work that you could really get up to. And Have you been there you know. since? No, I haven't. You, so you've never been there? Never. Oh. I, you know, people love the Gardner Museum, and I've, I've been there a lot you know, because of my time in Boston. I, I'm not a big fan of the Gardner Museum. Um, for one thing, it's very dark, and you know, I think according to the to the will they can't change that about it right yeah it's gonna um, be a certain way and um i don't know i always find it a little bit depressing somehow but uh, people yeah. love it but that that vermeer is just a beautiful painting well that's the thing about museums do say what you will about how they hang things or light things or or what but the work is the work you know yeah. what i mean and and that they have a very impressive you know group of work no for sure and uh yeah well i don't know what the hell i i i mean because these guys have just stolen and been like well we can't sell this stuff let's just get rid of it yeah it, i mean that how it's dumb can you be <laughs> such a strange story right because and they cut it out they cut it out of the uh, frame. yeah right why wouldn't you just take the frame i remember an episode of the three stooges that had to do with an art theft and, <laughs> and the criminal cut it out of the frame and even when i was six i thought to myself don't do that yeah why would you do that yeah. just take the whole thing that made me question everything about yeah. their knowledge of trying to sell this. It just, you know, someone told them this stuff is priceless and then they didn't realize that trimming it out of the frame is probably going to de decrease its value. Slightly. Right. <laughs> not, I, not to mention you can't sell this stuff without getting caught. Although art still is stolen, right? I mean, there are other cases of people stealing art. What do they think they're going to do with it? I. Uh, Personally, I think the only thing they can think is, I'm going to keep this for myself. Uh -huh. That's the only one that makes sense. Like if right. someone stole a Picasso and they're like, I just want to hang one in my house, and they really love it. It's not to show other people because other people would be like, well, what is that? And then the cat's out of the bag. Right. So you got to like want to steal this thing just so you can have it, which is really awful. Like, you know, I just want me to look at this thing forever. I know, but that terrible. just seems like fiction to me. Like that, like, yeah, that person doesn't really exist. I <laughs> know. Just us, maybe? Yeah. Like, all art thefts are done by artists who really right. wanted that piece. Yeah. Do you ever think of that, though? Like, I love, you know, like I mentioned, I love Aang. But I do, like, think to myself, would I really want to own an Aang and hang it in my house? I'm not sure. I think about that all the time because I, there's work that I love, and then rarely there's work that I want. Want to have, yeah. And I, it's almost never Right. Because I'm happy just looking at things. But once in a while, for some reason, there's an image where I think, I'd hang that. I'd like to have that in my house. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true, very that's rare. True. But I don't know what it is. I don't know what the metric is. But there's some images that I just feel like I could look at that every day. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's no, kind of like a relationship, you know? It's like you meet people, you date people, and you're like, oh, I like that person. They're fun to hang out with. And then once in a while, you just find someone, and you're like, I could be with this person. Yeah, you know? that's a It's good a metaphor. different kind of love of an image. Right. <laughs> that said, what's a hanging right now? Yeah, and I, I've traded a lot of work, which to me is my favorite kind of work to have because I have a relationship with those people. So it feels like friends hanging around the room in a way, which is nice. Yeah, I wish I could do that. I, I don't make enough work to be able to do that. Um, I've done it a little bit, but um, I really wish I could do that. I admire um, people, you know, friends of mine who have big collections. And I know some people who um, have been able to you know, sell some of that work for a lot of money. Yeah. That's the thing. I could never do that, I feel like, personally, unless I, it was like dire straits. I take that back. I, I know some people who were smart enough 
to buy work by certain artists when it was very affordable. Some oh, artists yeah. who were able to do right. that. So it wasn't trades. Um, and sell the work. Right, yeah. that's a little bit more questionable, right? Like when you trade and then sell. I have, like the in the back of, of my that. mind, when I, and I have no right to feel this, when I trade with someone, I always think, well, I hope they don't just sell that eventually. <laughs> right. Not that they would make any money from it, but I'm just, it's like the, you know, it's like when you give someone a gift and you hope they don't re-gift it to someone else. Like you hope they like it and they want to be with it. Although I suppose like if you trade with somebody and the, the person's had it for 30 years and then they're retiring and they can sell it for a lot of money to... It's great, yeah. Yeah, that's totally fine, right? No, it'd be more the six to six month to one year turnaround right, that would be right. a little bit of a shot in the gut. <laughs> Tra- yeah, trading art in order to um, what's that term flip with it. collectors? Yeah, flip, flip it. Flip it. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. I, it either means one thing: that person doesn't like you or your work, or you're really successful. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, "I'm yeah. cashing out on this person." That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I guess you'd have to do prints, right? Like do an addition to trade with people. Yeah, and I don't. I mean, yeah. I, and I, I don't do prints. Um, oh, the irony with your with your dad in the printmaking. Was yeah. he like doing typeset stuff? Or I think so. I think it was like or? typesetting and um, he had a he had a, a a printing business in Palestine in the 50s, early 50s. Whoa. And um, yeah, I think it was offset typesetting, like all of these old and it, you know some kind of photo engraving. Yeah, is that a kind it's cool stuff? Yeah, yeah, like, no, definitely. Setting, printing is really cool. Yeah, I but I could see you doing a lithograph. No, I, I, I wouldn't mind it. Mind doing it. I've just the opportunity has never come up. Yeah, I, I taught printmaking as a TA in graduate school, and uh, lithography was the one thing I just didn't understand. I'm like, who wants to sit here and scrub a Do rock? Do the rendering. <laughs> I mean, it seemed like such a pain in the ass. Yeah. But my work never really translates that sensibility. Uh-huh. I could see you doing a lithograph and it'd be wonderful. So. Yeah. You know. Did um did you TA for Rochelle? I did. Yes, I did. Teaching printmaking. Yeah. Yep. And I remember when I took her my first year, I took her printmaking class. I was doing digital prints. So what I would do mm-hmm. is I would ink a plate and then I would press it into the or no what I did would I would have a blank plate and I'd run it through on Japanese paper and emboss it uh-huh. and then I would feed that through the printer oh, cool. and then digitally oh, print onto that section and I remember feeling immense guilt like I'm cheating or something because uh-huh. at that time it was kind of like digital people were like what? Oh, that's, that's I think not. that's a really interesting idea it was fun yeah. I, I thought it was really cool but I, I got a, I had a little guilt Huh. Digital guilt. <laughs> and would you make additions? Like, would you emboss multiple sheets of paper and then do the same print on them? Or what, were they unique? Well, I think I, this was for an assignment. So oh, okay. I think I did five unique ones. Uh-huh. I did five different ones. They were like APs or something. Uh-huh. I don't know. But I guess because they were digital, I thought, oh, well, I'll do different ones because then sure. yeah. it's not like I'm just pumping out. Yeah. Well, at that point, it didn't matter. It was just an assignment. I was in a class, you know. But, uh, but, I like but the idea. since then, I've never done any. I mean, I've just done screen prints. And, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I that, do that stuff. That would lend itself to your work, right? Screen printing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, people I love, like Richard Estes is one of my favorite you know, artists, and I love his screen prints more than the paintings. Richard Estes? Yeah. Really? I didn't know. He does screen prints? Oh, he did. Oh, they're so great. And, and well, I, and, I like them because they... They're a little less photorealistic. Oh, really? A little, a little touch more graphic. So huh. for me, like the sensibility is like right down, you know, Main Street oh, for me. That's really interesting. So. I'll have to look them up. Yeah, I, I, I don't love a lot of the photorealists, but I do like his work. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. Like his paintings are cool. Like, you know, they are what they are. They're yeah. amazing feats of photorealism. I'm telling you, Google is prints. Okay. I think yeah, there's I something in there that's even, I don't know. It might be, it's just my personal thing. But he did this suite of images. I forget what it was called. It was a portfolio. And I've been, you know, eyeing them on, you know, 
online auction and they're not that expensive. Hmm. I've been thinking about getting one, but they're really cool. They're just all these different, you know, images of like planes and cities and storefronts and stuff. But the, the screen printing creates a barrier that becomes to me more interesting than him just painting it photorealistically. Is he still working? That's a good question. I don't know. I feel like <laughs> should Google. Yeah, I, I have to Google it. <laughs> yeah, I would too. Uh, let's see. Is he still working? He could uh, be. People right? also he ask: Is Richard Estes still painting? Um, I think so. Huh. I can't even think of who he shows with. Can you? Uh, I see the. Louis Meisel Gallery. Oh, really? Huh. He should be with someone like Zwerner or Gagosian. I mean, or that, Gladstone, that... like Barbara Gladstone picked up Robert Bechtel. Oh, yeah. Well, those are cool, though. The Bechtel paintings, I feel like, are a little yeah. weird in a great way. No, like said those like are... you were talking about, a little off. Like yeah. John Wesley was a pop artist. It was just a little yeah, off right. in a really great no, way. Definitely. You know, no, Bechtel's like, paintings, especially of the from the '60s, are I think amazing. Oh yeah, those are really cool paintings. Yeah, just a little off. Well, what? So you are you working on a show now? Yeah, I'm like working on a show yet, for you? with Mark Selwyn in March, and oh, wow. um, it's That's going to be small paintings. Door. Yeah, and um, I'm working on a painting for a show Jeffrey Deitch is curating. Uh, where he's asking artists to respond to Manet's Luncheon on the Grass. So I'm doing a kind of oh, riff on that. My favorite painting oh, ever. Oh, really? It is an amazing Dejeuner painting. Dejeuner Yeah. I took a class on that painting. Oh, really? Just the painting. Interesting. And all the references that he used from Rubens. And like, it is, it's amazing. Yeah, uh, for, that painting's great. Was it a class at Yale? No, that was Penn State. Penn State. Who, who taught it? And I forget his name. He oh. was an old guy who... Huh. Every semester was a different um, sort of like zoom in on something. Oh, that's and a great class. Bef- yeah, the semester before was on Kandinsky, and it was one of my favorite paintings. And I was like, "Oh, I'm going to take this class." And I got in, and he was like, "It's Dejeuner sur Lab," and I was like, "This is bullshit." Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> I was so upset, but there was no options to change the class, so I stayed with it, and it was my favorite class, my favorite art history. Yeah, class. It was great. I, I, I you know. That painting, I've seen it in person, and for yeah, years, yeah, and for years it was, you know, I mean, sort of in my peripheral vision. I, I wasn't dismissive of it, but I didn't think much of it. But then when Jeffrey asked me to be in the show, um, I really started looking at it, and that is just such an incredible painting. You know, it's such an inexplicable painting. You know, where really those decisions weird. came from, they just, they yield no answers, in my opinion. And, you know, a lot of art historians have offered, offered reasons for the way that, the re, for why the painting looks that way. But they're, in the end, not for me, not that convincing. This class was convincing. Was it? We, we there were scores of references Does he, that was researched. Yeah. I, I forget the name of the guy who taught the class, but... I mean, he would show these old, you know, I think there were Rubens lithographs. I can't remember. This is a long time ago. Um, but the the evidence was irrefutable, in my opinion. Well, like, I was just like, this is really interesting. Evidence in what sense? That, you mean he the evidence of the... He would triangulate stuff that Manet was looking at and proof of him looking at oh, those yeah. things. No, that sketches sure. that went into it. Yeah. You know. I mean, I think that's traceable and that's convincing. I meant more that I don't... You know, like sometimes an art historian and several art historians have done this, and maybe this is universal or near universal with art historians, is they talk about Manet as the beginning of flatness and abstraction. But, I, but yeah. you know, I, I think it's a little bit, I think that's a little bit retrospective. Do you know what I mean? Now that we're looking back. But right. surely, like, he wasn't thinking of that. Like, he wasn't thinking that this is you know, I'm initiating some big shift towards flatness. Like, I just don't think that would have been within his, I don't think he would have been, you know, I don't think anybody had gotten to that point to make that decision. And then there, there is a, you know, there are paintings from 
European art history that are flat. You know, like he's not the only person who made flat paintings. Right. And then there, he's, not, he's also not the only person who made paintings where a figure very pointedly turns toward the viewer. And so it's not like, you know, that decision in Manet wasn't, he didn't initiate that. Like you can, you know, David actually did that at the end of his life. And so, and then I'm, I'm not totally convinced by that painting being influenced by photography. Um, although some people have made like good cases for it. So where the strangeness in that painting comes from, for me, is still very difficult to locate and also the source of his decisions, like why, the, why does the landscape look like a backdrop? Um, you know, why is so much of the um, psychological energy centered on that, on that one female figure? You know, why aren't those figures, don't, don't they seem to be communicating with each other? It's just an endless um, series of questions for me that is, I, I find really fascinating. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, the... But the the thing, like, if you look at Olympica, I mean, he wasn't the the first person to paint a courtesan, but it was the way that he yeah. did it and looking at the viewer that was kind of punk. And then the barmaid one with the woman behind the bar and then the reflection being at a different angle, you could say that that decision was made out of, I mean, that, that was pretty purposeful. You know what I mean? For sure. It's like two perspectives at one, yeah. which he's probably not saying to himself, I'm inventing cubism, but... In a way, it was a bold move that was, you know, pretty remarkable at the time. So, and sometimes, yeah. you know, it's it's true that some decisions might have been made from just like limitations of ability or maybe not focusing or it's hard to say, but he is compelling in that sense. Like, yeah. Like it's, he made interesting stuff. I mean, with Manet though, um, you know, with Cezanne, I think that probably probably what started some of his decisions were a certain kind of um, inability, right? Like he didn't quite have the skills that would have been expected of an artist at that time, um, which isn't to say, I mean, I, you know, I think he's an incredible artist. Um, so thank God he didn't have those skills. But Manet, yeah. I, I think, did actually. Like if you look at that guitar player at the Met, you know, that's yeah. a beautifully made painting, right? That's when he, he made that when he was young. Like, I think he yeah. could have. You know, there was just a strange um, unpredictability. I almost think of it as like a proto-Dada dismissal of any kind of standards that were expected of artists yeah. at that time, which I love about him. Yeah, and that was like a precursor. I mean, Picasso was the ultimate of like, he had all that ability. Picasso right, would, yeah. you know, paint beautifully. And he was just like, screw it. I'm you know, going to burst through all these doors of like next thing, you know. And if you have ever, have you seen his sketches of Dejeuner sur l'herbe? Like his interpretations? I'm sure, yeah. Oh, They're it, pretty great. Yeah, I'm sure I've seen them. I mean, the thing about Picasso though is like all, you know, through all of his invention, his enormous skill is always evident. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and in a way, he remained a kind of classicist. You know, like classical cubism is really a kind of like classical painting. You know, it's such yes. an ordered painting. Where Manet seemed to be always, you know, disregarding any kind of standards. You know, which makes his paintings thrilling for me. Right. Um, like yeah. I, I forget it's the blurry area again. Yeah. You know? Uh huh. Because Picasso, even when he was simplifying things down to like a face and a stick or something, it was still beautifully done and perfect. Like the yeah, the balance absolutely. of it. I, like he couldn't help yeah. being great at right. that. Whereas Manet, you're always like, well, what, you know, what, what's he, you can't figure it out. Anymore. Yeah, and Which also is, with Picasso, you know, you can trace Picasso's cubism, you know, very clearly back to Cezanne. You know, there's an unbroken chain of development. Yeah. Where, you know, as you were saying, Manet has many, many references, many predecessors, but it's not quite as unbroken a chain. You know, there's something with Manet's work that almost seems to come out of nowhere. Right. You know, like those, those paintings from the 1860s. Where did they come from? They don't make right. sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. I... I it's funny because, I mean, it's into the weeds with Manet. I feel like there's a lot of people who are just like, what the hell are you t 
talked yeah. about it. I love it. You oh, know, me it's, too. I love that that niche of like art history and that mm-hmm. that time is I think critical. But then again, I don't think I would have that appreciation if I didn't take that class. Not huh. to the extent that I have it. So that's why I, you know people like to say art school, smart school, and you know it's a sh- scam or whatever. But I do think there's something to be said for being exposed to things like that when you're not expecting it. And yeah, for really, sure. You know, enlighten the way you think about uh-huh. you know, work and creativity. Sounds like a great class. I'd like to see more of those where the class really focuses on a deep dive into a painting or maybe a, a small set of paintings. I that class was so impactful to me that I do that now you and I am not qualified. Uh-huh. Well, I, <laughs> I did a, I did are. a course on Guernica on the uh-huh. whole the whole class was on Guernica and we broke down everything from black and white to you know newspaper political to you know um icons and symbols and references and um wartime work and whatever you know we t- each week it was something else or what and and I loved it you know, I love doing that and going deep divey, especially now when things are so quick, everything's yeah. like a quick read, no, that's right. you know, to like actually dig into, you know, like it would be like listening to a record, like a Herbie uh-huh. Hancock record and just like deep diving. Okay. Oh, this is the instrumentation he used. Like, it's just fun to do that. You know, yeah. but I think for artists, it's important to be able to have that ability to occasionally just really look deeply into something. Cause you learn something in that process that, you know, that, uh, it avoids just the surface reading of everything in life, which is kind of, you know, now with like 30 second videos or Absolutely. You know, 120 characters or whatever it is, like we're more attuned to that surface quickness. Yeah, so. absolutely. I also think that you're, um, you're qualified. I mean, as an artist, you know, you have a way of looking at and understanding a painting that, you know, I'm not diminishing art historians at all, but we, we have, we come at works of art, with a different set of, you know, skills and backgrounds. And so I think it's completely yeah. legitimate for an artist to do that because they're going to yeah, take I a different just, approach. I would feel self-conscious if there was a Picasso expert who taught a class yeah. on Karen. <laughs> but then again, that can be too academic or it could go too formal. And there's something, like you're saying, the way artists interpret work is totally different than the way art historians do. Yeah. You know, you know and I mean, I notice this all the time and I don't mean this as a, a criticism at all, but during the pandemic, um, a, a friend of mine um, who's an art historian told me about these YouTube videos that the curators at the Frick were doing, and I think they're called Cocktails with a Curator. Have you watched any of those? No. Well, they talk about different paintings at the Frick. They're actually pretty interesting. Like they talk about the Veroneses at the Frick, and they talk about all the major paintings. And um, I've, I've watched several of them, but all they do is talk about the iconography and the meaning associated with that iconography, but never how meaning also comes out of the way the paintings are made or the form. They, 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 don't, they never talk about composition. You know, they never talk about the formal elements, which is just, that's, you know, just their approach, and that's fine. You know, and I learned a lot, actually, because I didn't know all the symbolism in those Veronese paintings. And that was interesting. Uh, but it's just a different way of looking at work. Yeah. It's a, it's a different analytical read, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's, it comes out of that kind of, you know, a lot of art history has a specific analytical bent to it. Right. You know? And just like artists, we have a bent to it too. We see it through the association of making things as opposed to, uh, researching or or analyzing things. Yeah, you know, like and, I, I feel a gut reaction when I see a Brothko. I'm right. not just thinking about it in relation to the abstract work before it and what this means to distill it to color. It's also the the motion and all that other side of it of yeah, the physical absolutely. aspects of it. Yeah, or you know Rothko for sure, or for that matter, of Veronese. You know, like when I look at the way those are put together, I have a gut reaction to it, or you know, and an, affective relationship to it not just an analytic relationship to it for sure sometimes when i look at old dutch paintings i'm almost as interested in this fact that they tack the sides to the stretcher yeah, as opposed to like definitely. wrapping it around right. that in something to me whereas uh-huh. i don't know if art historians really care about that right. you know what i mean but i find it yeah. fascinating I'm like well, they use yeah, tacks this is amazing 
Yeah, it's yeah. good stuff. Um, so, how do people like? W- what's the best way for people to check out your work? I mean, you have this show coming up. Where's the show coming up in March? Mark Selwyn in Los Angeles. Okay, and and, and the show, the group show at Jeffrey Deitch opens in February, and that's also Los Angeles. And oh, then I, I, I have a show that's tentatively scheduled with Miles McHenry for October 2023. So, I'll, you know, that's in the distance. Now, when you, for a solo show like that, are you already turning the wheel in the mind? Or is it still, yeah. does it develop over time? You know... I mean, I guess it develops over time, but I I am having some second thoughts about what I want to paint. So I actually have to talk to Miles about it. Um, we're going to talk next week. So I'm a, it's a little bit up in the air exactly what I'm going to be doing for that show. Well, that's fun to yeah. not know exactly and to, yeah, to work sure. that out. Yeah. It's exciting. Well, I look forward to that. I wish I could see that. I mean, I'll guess I'll have to see it on the internet. But the Dejeuner Celeb show sounds amazing. Yeah, I actually don't know the other artists in it, um, but uh, it, I, you know, I think Cecily Brown is in it. I only say that because I saw I saw a painting she did clearly based on the Manet painting on her Instagram feed. That would be strange um, if a, a strange coincidence. That would be a strange <laughs> coincidence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about that show. That's great. And uh, you do online stuff too, social media and website? Yeah, I have an Instagram, and it's just my name. And my my website is Um, You know, I used to have KurtKauper.com, but I let it lapse and someone took it. <laughs> and someone <laughs> owns that now. What, is it a fan site or is it like some other no, business? No, um, it looks to me like it, it passes as some kind of commercial website, but it looks to me like someone just took that name. You know, apparently people do this. They'll buy lapsed websites and then, you know, in the expectation that the person, right, the person's going to need to buy it back. And I think that's what happened to it because it's some weird um, website if you go to KurtKauper.com. And as far as as I know, there are no other Kurt Kaupers in the United States. My last name is uncommon enough. Yeah. Well, maybe you can offer them 20 bucks. I've heard that they try to get at least like $1,000 <laughs> or something. Crazy. Well, my yeah. BrianEffer.com, I believe, is a tax consultancy in London. Oh, really? London. Yeah. Uh-huh. So what so do I you have? have? .net. We're starting .net, a new wave. Yeah. .net is where wow. it's at. Yeah, I had KurtCalperStudio.com for a while, but I was convinced to do .net. It seems hard to get .net, though, to be up high on the search. Have you found that to be the case? Admittedly, I haven't Googled myself uh-huh. lately, but uh, Brian Alfred is m- maybe as rare as Kurt Cowper. Uh-huh. I mean, there's n- almost no Alfreds in this country. There's Alfords uh-huh. and Alfords, but not oh, a lot really? of Alfreds. Oh, really? As a last name? Oh, yeah, that's interesting. It's very rare, so I'm, uh-huh. I'm lucky in that sense. Well, listen, it was great talking. Thanks so much. For yeah, it was here. great talking to you, too. Thanks for inviting me. I can't wait to see the show. I mean, maybe at that point we'll all be able to congregate. Yeah, well, all hopefully. this will be behind us, or at yeah. least, yeah, fingers crossed. Yep. All right. All right. Well, thanks, Brian. I'll Thank talk to you, you soon. Okay. <laughs>